Hey gang, what's up? Welcome back here to another edition of Intuitive Angling and thanks a lot for taking some time to check the video out. Always grateful for that. And guys, today we are gonna talk about the uh, Zal Dangerous podcast that had uh, Josh Jones on a couple weeks ago. I think he's been on a couple times, but anyway, this particular uh, episode they had on a couple weeks ago was uh, strictly devoted to uh, the topic of live scope. And of course, I couldn't pass that up, so you know, we gotta do a video on it. Uh, so we're going to get into that in today's uh, in, in today's intuitive angling real quick guys man it is we have frost on the ground for the first time this morning which means fall is here and i just want to invite everybody real quick to check out our fall lake map breakdowns at fish um, this is a great resource to learn more about your favorite lake and to get some good spots if you're not familiar with the lake or even if you are familiar with the lake um, you might get some more good spots on there so if you're interested uh, just check out the link in the description for our lake map breakdowns much appreciated okay guys i'm a little late on on this i i the reason a couple of reasons i'm doing this video is i didn't even know that I'd, i've been gone for the last two week to turn two weeks to tournaments so i haven't i've sort of been out of the loop a little bit but my inbox on some of my messaging social media has gotten blown up by this everybody saying you need to check out the zell dangers podcast on josh jones i mean i I got dozens of messages about that. So anyway, I was yesterday I finished up the BFL Regional at Lake Ufall, Oklahoma, and I had a chance to listen to the podcast uh, on the way back there. So first of all, I'll say this. It's like, I, I guess I'm sort of the unofficial leader in the anti-LiveScope movement, and I guess Josh Jones is sort of the, uh, the, the arguably, arguably the, uh, the most uh, you know, well-known, successful, uh, live scoper forward with forward facing sonar in terms of catching giant bass. So you think there there might be a little bit of conflict there. But guys, I'll tell you right off the bat before I even get in this interview, um, I am a Josh Jones fan now. After I saw that podcast, I I got nothing but respect for that dude. He he's super intelligent. He he's he came across he he came across with gr a great deal of critical thinking skills super laid back guy, very likable, very friendly. Um, and I agreed with a lot of the points he made on there. So, uh, you know, I don't know Josh, I've never met him before. And I, the only, the only thing I know about him is, is, you know, how famous he is for catching giant bass by live scoping. But after watching this podcast, um, I like the guy, man, he seems super cool. And I got a lot of respect for him. I think I think that he handled that interview perfectly. Um, I was extremely surprised. It was not what I was expecting as far as to, for somebody like that to to say. I want, and that's the point of the video. I want to get into this. Another thing before we get into this, guys, I got to say right off the bat again, is um, Chris Zaldane, Chris and Trey Zaldane, they their podcast is second to none. I. I really feel that they have the best podcast in the entire industry. They, those two, they know more about this industry than about any two people I know about. They ask the right questions. They, they remind me a little bit, or they're sort of um, got the same vibe as Joe Rogan's podcast in terms of Joe, how he handles the guests. Because I think one of the good traits of a podcaster is, is they ask the right questions and they let their guests carry the show a little bit and that's sort of what they do but if you guys have never seen uh zell dangerous podcast i'd highly suggest you check it out i'll put their link in the description to this video too but um i every time i watch their podcast i get more and more impressed with um how they're doing with this so job well done there okay anyway the first thing that came to my mind in this and that right off the bat is even though josh jones is a hardcore famous live scoper that's had tremendous amount of success, he acknowledges the reality of the situation from a sustainability standpoint, because one of the points that he made repeatedly throughout the whole show was his concern about the long-term sustainability, conservation of our resource, and the dangers that forward-facing sonar presents to that. It's the same stuff I've been talking about, guys. I've been talking about this for two years, and to hear somebody of his um, background within that, with that technology to recognize that, I was extremely impressed. Most people don't get that. And Josh Jones gets it. Even though he is a live scoper, he gets that fact. And he understands the danger 
that it possibly presents to the future. Now, our, maybe our remedies for that, you know, vary a little bit, but he is very aware from a conservation standpoint, not only from the, the increased pressure that forward-facing sonar technology and other technology is going to have on the sport, but as far as, you know, other issues like keeping bass in live wells, tournament, you know, delayed mortality and that type of stuff. That was, to me, the most impressive part of listening to him talk is, um, is seeing that particular side of it. And it's almost like he was, um, he had sort of like a dilemma because he really loves the technology, but at the same time, he understands the danger that the technology uh, presents, sort of like Elon Musk with artificial intelligence. So I was extremely impressed from, from that standpoint. But there was a couple different things that came up that I, that I want to sort of talk about here, sort of give you my opinion that came up in the podcast. There's really only two things that they touched about in this podcast, two things they touched upon in the whole live scope discussion. And that was the sustainability and the conservation issue and the fact that... Um, a, not, I don't want to say an unfair advantage, but the fact how it's changing the game in terms of who is successful in the sport now. And there's there's a ton of other stuff. You guys have heard me talk about all the reasons I'm against it, and that's just, the, they just touched upon two of the many more that they could have touched upon, but they, they touched upon two important aspects. So let's talk a little bit about that. One of the things that Josh was talking about was the fact that so many people are live scoping now. They're getting better at live scoping and they're catching more big bass than they ever have before. And even, you know, Chris made a point on this too, as far as when these big bass get caught, you know, especially during the warmer months from live scoping and they're put in a live well for pictures or tournament ways in or whatever, most of those fish will die at some point. When you take a fish, and Chris made a really good point about if you have a really big bass that's living, you know, in, in an optimum water depth, optimum, you know, oxygen content levels, and they're 15, 16 year old giant bass and they're put into a live well, hauled around all day, they're probably gonna die of delayed mortality even if they're released. So they really brought that point to light, which I think needs to be stressed more and more because what happens as you get more people live scoping and you get more people successful at it, the more pressure that gets on those fisheries from that end of it. Now that's just one part of it. You're only talking about the species of bass. There's, it affects every other species of fish out there, crappie, everything like that. So the, the fact that they brought up the sustainability and conservation point of that is really, really important. I'm really, really happy to see that. And they also talked a little bit about, and like I said, you guys need to watch the whole podcast. I'm just sort of giving you my opinion on some highlights, but one of the things that they talked about a little bit is the uh, game and fish departments intervening on this. Guys, I wouldn't hold my breath. Now, I'm not saying that the game and fish departments around the country do not do a good job and they don't provide a service, but I have spoken to lots of them in many states, and in my opinion, they sort of drag their feet on issues like this. They it's almost like they, the, to them, fish is a resource to be, it's, it's almost like um, something that you just, you know, it's like a vegetable garden or something. And they don't, they don't understand some of the more subtle aspects of it. So they, they're basically saying that the conservation departments, and I've always said too, would be the ones to eventually stop it. But I wouldn't hold my breath because like I said, I don't know how much of a vested interest that they have into that. And, um, I, I'm just not real confident that they're going to come out and save us on this, this, this particular deal. But that was one of the biggest parts of the, con of the conservation or biggest parts of the podcast was the conservation issues. Now, another part <coughs> that I found really interesting was um, the, the, con the, the conversation around the tournament side of it, as far as how you're seeing anglers with not much experience excelling in the sport now. And this is another, th this is a part of the anti-live scope movement, but it's not the most important, but it is an issue that needs to be addressed here. One of the things that I think that Chris and Trait took offense a little bit, and maybe uh, Josh did too, was a comment that Matt Heron made about, um, he feels that with live scope, people, you know, 
you, you can have people out there that don't have any experience in fishing and all of a sudden come out and start doing good. That is a true statement. There's a reality to that because you're seeing the, the, the fields and tournaments get younger and younger and younger, especially like in the Bassmaster Opens, because of the forward-facing sonar technology. All they have to be is good at deciphering and reading that in order to be successful. They don't have to have any background knowledge on, on, on the instincts and the intuitions around fishing, seasonal movements, seasonal patterns, different type of approaches that require decades of learning. Now, one of the things that I agree with Matt, what he said on this, because one of the things that I think is important in the sport is that you pay your dues in it. Part of the tradition in the sport is that you are in the trend or you're, you, you do, you, you put in your due diligence and that due diligence is rewarded over a period of time. Because what happens like for the most part of an, the entire history of professional fishing, you started seeing anglers really, really excel once they got into their mid to late thirties. Like it's like from 35 to 45, was the peak of an angler's career because it took that long to master those different aspects of learning about bass behavior and movement. That was like the accepted norm. And now you're having these kids right out of high school come in and complete, the 20 some year old kids come in and just completely dominate simply because they can read live scope. And one of the most, the big, one of the things that Josh Jones said that I respected more than anything else, he goes, I don't think he said, Josh, and remember, Josh is a, is the number one live scoper in the country. He goes, I don't think somebody's tournament success should be measured by how good they can read a graph. And that is so true out there, guys. There is a tradition in the sport where you have got to, you've got to put in the time and you've got to earn it. And when you have an artificial variable come in there that allow somebody with no experience whatsoever to come in and beat anglers out there that have put in decades of time on the water. And they even brought up the point where they theorized one of the reasons Kevin Van Dam quit fishing is he could not compete against the live scopers anymore. I'm not speaking for Kevin, but I can see how that would be true. And the fact that he, he simply cannot dominate like he did before. He was one of the first anglers out there to dominate with side imaging technology. But now, with live imaging technology, he can't do it. Kevin Van Dam is just another angler out there in the sea of anglers that get watered down by forward-facing sonar technology. I mean, I hear it all the time out there about most guys out there, if they're forced to go to the bank, they can't do it. They, even Josh Jones said, he goes, if I had to go to the bank, he, he said he'd get his butt kicked in there. So from that standpoint, it's morphing the sport into something that is not fair to the tradition of the sport of bass fishing. And that tradition comes with time on the water and experience and cultivating your craft and mastering your craft out there. That's getting all taken away simply because of an electronic unit out there. And that is, to me, that's a disservice to the sport. That's a disrespect to the fish. That's, uh, that's undermining everything about what traditional professional bass fishing is for no reason other than money. That's all there is to it out there. And one of the things about this is that Chris brought up, Chris and uh, Trey brought up another point about sort of the dilemma that Chase Anderson, who owns Bassmaster, is in over this decision on what to do with forward-facing sonar. Josh made the comment, he thought it should, he, half the tournaments, they should not allow it in, and the other half of the season, they should allow it in. And that's a debate everybody could have with that. <coughs> but it, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> excuse me, I just got some a sinus infection I'm getting over. But one of the things about that is that they, they were talking about this dilemma that Chase Anderson is, is to make a decision because of the outcry that the pro anglers made against LiveScope after the last two smallmouth tournaments. Here's a message to Chase Anderson from Randy Blockett. Chase, if you do this, if you say, if, if Bass would come out and say, after close consideration, we decided that um, forward-facing sonar is not good for the sport or our organization, the same they did with the A-Rig. 
they made a press release out there when they banned the A-Rig saying that we feel that, you know, the single hook, one rod, one reel lies within the tradition of, of sport and it serves it better, so they banned the A-Rig. Chase, if you come out and say, we've analyzed this stuff out there, we don't like the direction this is going, we have to set a baseline somewhere in professional fishing where technology does not uh, morph the sport into something that we don't want to, and from that decision, we are not going to allow forward-facing sonar in any of our Bassmaster events. You can use down imaging, side imaging, and 2D sonar and GPS mapping, and that's the baseline. Just like they have to use wooden bats in baseball, that is the baseline that the Bassmaster Sportsman Society is going to use from now, no forward-facing sonar. The stock in Bassmaster would go through the freaking roof if they did that. The respect that they would get from the bass fishing public if they made that stance in light of what everybody knows it is, it's all about money, nothing else. This entire decision is about the subsidies and the, re and the uh, contracts that Bassmaster and the other organizations get from the electronic companies. There's nothing, there's nothing else because there's no other benefit to it. There's nothing that it benefits the sport. It doesn't benefit the integrity of the sport. It doesn't benefit the conservation aspect of it. It doesn't, it doesn't there's nothing good about it whatsoever other than that check they write every, every month but, or every year. But if they came out and made that stance against it, not only would the support of the bass fishing public be on the side of Bassmaster, but it would begin to open up the sales of other type of lure categories that are dwindling right now. Guys, do you know what forward-facing sonar is doing to the sales of tackle that are non-forward-facing sonar related? They are tanking right now, and they're gonna continue to tank. So when you're talking about an endemic industry that is suffering overall, basically because of one issue of forward-facing sonar, that is another business aspect. And another thing they talk about, the uh, Trey and Chris were talking about, well, we heard that the, the uh, ratings were not down in live scope events. I'm not saying somebody's lying, but I find that hard to believe. Until I see the Nielsen ratings personally, I simply do not believe that the ratings did, were not affected in live scope heavy tournaments because even Josh Jones said he doesn't watch them because it's boring. And it's to say everyone I talk to, I just simply do not believe that as far as the ratings go. But anyway, point of the video guys, this, 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 is, this is the best podcast I have ever seen on forward facing sonar is the Sal Dangerous podcast. Like I said, I'll put the link in the description. And again, it's well worth the watch on there. And it, like I said, I came away from this with, with a, a, a tremendous amount of respect for Josh Jones and Chris and Trey. I think they all three handled it very well. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it, it points to the right direction because the gist I got from the podcast, if you looked at it from an objective perspective, the vibe is, is that forward-facing sonar is not good for the sport. That's, that it is, and this is coming from three of the most aware people in this sport. You know, Chris and Trey Zaldane and Josh Jones are three of the most aware individuals I've seen in the sport, and they're, they're trying to see both sides of the story, but the overall vibe is that it's just, it's, if you had to weigh it out, good versus bad for the sport, it's more on the bad side of the sport. And again, Chase Anderson, you can become a hero on this, Bassmaster can be elevated to a level of stature they've never been before. It's going to bring in other sponsorship opportunities. And Garmin and Hummingbird and Lowrance can still sell 2D sonar, mapping systems, side imaging, you know, down imaging. It's not going to kill them to get rid of something that's killing the sport. That's my opinion on it. So anyway, guys, link in the description to that uh, Zaldangers video. Check it out. I think you'll like it. We'll talk later.